afternoon and welcome to Faraday Futures first quarter 2022 earnings conference call. Today's call is being recorded and we have allocated one hour for prepared remarks and Q&A. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mark Connolly, Vice President of Investor Relations. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you and welcome everyone to Faraday Futures first quarter 2022 earnings call. We filed our first quarter earnings report on Form 10-Q with the SEC today, May 23rd, 2022, and issued a press release summarizing those results. Joining the call today from Faraday Future is our Global Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Karsten Breitfeld, and our Interim Chief Financial Officer, Becky Roof. On today's call, we will provide an update on current business conditions, the status of our FF91 vehicle program, and discuss our first quarter financial results. You can find a copy of the Form 10-Q and the Q1 2022 press release now and a replay and transcript of this call later today in the Investor Relations section of our website at investors.ff.com. Please note that on this call, we will be making forward-looking statements based on current expectations and assumptions, which are subject to risks and uncertainties. These statements reflect our views only as of today, should not be relied upon as representative views as of any subsequent date and we undertake no obligation to revise or publicly release the, the results of any revision to these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. These statements are subject to a variety of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from expectations. For further discussion of the material risks and other important factors that could affect our financial results, please refer to our filings with the SEC. With that, I will turn the call over to Dr. Carson Breitfeld, Global CEO of Faraday Future. Thank you, Mark, uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I would like to start by thanking Faraday Futures shareholders, employees, advisors, and suppliers for their commitment and support. As of this morning, I'm happy to say uh, we are once again current with our quarterly financial filings, and we expect to file our S1A promptly. I'm also very happy to be able to introduce you to our interim CFO, Becky Roof. Becky has extensive public and private company CFO experience, and we are delighted to have her here with us at Faraday Future. Becky brings exceptional experience and relationships that are helping us quickly strengthen and build our financial reporting and systems. Chuck McBride, who has served briefly as our CFO, left the company for health reasons. Uh, and our board has uh, a search for a permanent CFO underway, but our most critical finance priority right now is to strengthen our systems and processes, and backing is making that happen. To begin, I'm going to briefly discuss the special committee review, which was recently completed, uh, and the additional remediation actions that are being implemented. Then I will review our first quarter progress and bring you up to date on our path to launching the FF9 one later this year. And then I will pass the call to Becky to discuss our Q1 results. So let's get started. In the fourth quarter of 2021, our board of directors formed a special committee to investigate allegations of inaccurate company disclosures. That investigation resulted in a significant delay in the filing of our Q3 2021 financial and our full year 2021 financial. That investigation was completed in April and our quarterly and annual financial filings are once again current. The special committee concluded that, except as described in the company's form 8K, which was filed in February 1st, 2022, other substantive allegations of inaccurate disclosures that the special committee evaluated including those made in the short seller report, were not supported by the evidence reviewed. However, the special committee did identify certain issues, including inconsistencies in statements that were made to some investors, weaknesses in some internal controls, and in our corporate compliance structure. These are date detailed in the 8K from February 1st, 2022. The special committee looked at an exceptionally wide range of issues and recommended a number of remedial actions which have been uh, implemented or are being implemented right now. These remedial actions include certain employees being separated from the company, 
changes in the roles and responsibilities of certain other employees, disciplinary actions, changes in the way we collect and uh, process information, and uh, some organizational changes. A summary of the special committee investigation and its finding can be found in our 2021-10K, which we filed on May 13, 2022. Now, speaking both as CEO and as member of the board, I sincerely believe that the remediation actions we have taken are a very positive step for our organization and for all of our stakeholders. I want to thank Sue Swenson, our executive chairperson who led the special committee for her leadership, and the entire board for their hard work and commitment to this important and necessary process. I truly believe that we are already a stronger and better company as a result of this investigation and the remediation actions we are taking. Now, let me turn to the first quarter on our business progress. I'm very pleased to say that thanks to the exceptional dedication of our team, uh, we continue to make impressive progress with our business plan. I'm especially pleased by what I'm seeing during my visits to our Hanford manufacturing plant under the very capable leadership of Metal, uh, our head of manufacturing, and his excellent team. With the major concrete work complete, we have been able to accelerate the pace of progress. The systems and equipment installation work has been first rate, and we are very much on track. We recently announced that we marked our fourth and fifth milestones the fourth being production, production intent vehicles built for final engineering, validation, and certification. And the fifth, start of mechanical and electrical systems installation. Back in February, we celebrated the completion of the first production intent vehicle built in Hanford. If you have been following us on social media, you will have seen that several more production intent vehicles are being assembled now and each new production intent vehicle is built for a specific purpose and use, and each one goes closer to the final product. We will be building many more over the next few months for use in testing, validation, and also for marketing. As we build more production intent cars, you will begin to see more of them at outside events, and we are beginning already to ramp up our visibility. Currently, we are still dedicating most of our prototypes and production intent vehicles to testing and validation. Uh, but by the end of the second quarter, we expect to have enough on hand to put them in front of potential buyers and investors more often. We will, of course, continue to welcome investors at our Hanford production facility and headquarters. About 80% of the equipment we need at Hanford is already on site and the rest is on schedule to be delivered. Previously delivered equipment is being ready for installation. Um, as a reminder, completion of equipment installation is the sixth and final milestone before we start our production. I want to thank our vendors, our contractors, our employees, and everyone else who has helped keep us on the schedule during the very challenging period for the economy and for our team. The SF Nyman program is on track and proceeding well, and we are also making important progress on our longer-term business plan. This includes the development of the FF81 program. During the first quarter in 2022, we announced that Myongshin, an automotive manufacturer based in South Korea, has been contracted to manufacture the FF81, which will be Faraday Future's first high-volume vehicle. Myongxing is a part supplier and automotive manufacturer for numerous OEMs and is located near Seoul in South Korea. Its plant in Gunsan, where the FF81 will be manufactured, offers scale, flexibility, and an attractive port access. Under the agreement, Myongxing will maintain sufficient manufacturing capabilities and capacity to supply FF81 vehicles in accordance with company forecasts. Our agreement with Myongxin is capital efficient and a central part of our hybrid manufacturing strategy to reach high volume production quickly. We lease the Hanford plant where we will build the SF91 and Myongxin will provide the capital for the new plant in South Korea. 
This approach allows Faraday Future to leverage capital further and move much faster than if we built our own two plants ourselves. In addition, I'm very happy to announce that we have signed our lease for our first flagship store in Beverly Hills, California. We have also chosen a designer and began initial design work. In our third quarter 2021 and full year 2021 filings, we announced that we had 401 pre-orders as of March 31st, 2022. Pre-orders are fully refundable, non-binding paid deposits for the FF9 Futures Alliance and or the FF9 Futures vehicles available initially for sale to customers in the US and in China. FF91 Futurist Alliance pre-orders require a $5,000 deposit for customers in the US and a 50,000 renminbi deposit for customers in China. FF91 Futurist pre-orders require a $1,500 deposit for customers in the US and a 20,000 renminbi deposit for customers in China. As of today, our pre-order book is a reasonable match to our production expectations through 2022 year-end. As we begin to roll out our marketing program, I expect pre-orders to increase and keep pace with our production capacity. Keep in mind that the FF91 is not a high volume car. In 2023, for example, we expect to produce about six to 8,000 cars as we ramp production. So we are not looking to build an order book with pre-orders that we can't fill. Our marketing program for the FF91 is built around Faraday Future's unique user ecosystem concept. Our marketing will be heavily online and rely on our branding campaign, our co-creation partners, and our user community. We plan to show our car at car shows and high-end consumer, consumer events, and will be participating in a number of investor and consumer events to further showcase our production and tent vehicles. Potential customers are going to be seeing a lot more of us as we move closer to launch. The last six months have been challenging, and I want to thank our employees who have continued to demonstrate exceptional commitment and dedication. The team kept us on track as we have navigated many internal and external challenges. In a tough environment, we are still making excellent progress. So now I'm going to turn over the call to our CFO, Becky Roof. Becky, please. Thank you, Karsten. It's great to be with you today, and I'm excited to be working with you and with the entire Faraday Future team. As Karsten explained earlier, I'm here as interim CFO. I'm a managing director with Alex Partners, a financial advisory and consulting firm that provides short-term solutions to companies like Faraday Future. My mandate here is straightforward. Get our filings up to date, put programs in place to address weaknesses in internal systems and controls, advance the capital raise process, and help Carson and Sue identify a permanent CFO. Teams I led at Lordstown Motors and Eastman Kodak and elsewhere accomplished similar goals. In a relatively short time, I am happy to say that the team we have here has gotten our filings up to date and is making good progress on our other priorities. While the team here at Faraday Future is smaller than it needs to be, it is very high quality and we are building on a very solid foundation. Our finance and accounting teams have been working exceptionally hard to get our filings up to date and you should expect us to file our amended S1A shortly. Faraday Future reported an operating loss of approximately $149 million during the three months ended March 31, 2022, as compared to an operating loss of approximately $19 million for the three months ended March 31, 2021. The increase was primarily driven by an increase in engineering design and testing, or EV and T services, as the company continued to re-engage suppliers and made significant purchases for ed &T services to progress the development of the FF91, a significant increase in headcount and employee-related expenses, and an increase in professional services primarily related to the Special Committee investigation. 
net loss increased to approximately $153 million during the three months ended March 31, 2022, as compared to an, an approximately $76 million loss for the three months ended March 31, 2021. Turning to our balance sheet, total assets on March 31, 2022 were $706 million, compared to $907 million total assets on December 31, 2021. Total liabilities were approximately $271 million versus approximately $340 million on December 31, 2021. Since its inception, the company has incurred cumulative losses from operations and negative cash flows from operating activities, and the company's accumulated deficit was approximately $3 billion as of March 31, 2022. The company expects to continue to generate significant operating losses for the foreseeable future as we continue to incur expenses before we generate meaningful revenue. Cash as of March 31, 2022 was 276 million. The decrease in cash from December 31, 2021 to March 31, 2022 was about as expected given the pressure many companies in our industry are experiencing with logistics and materials costs and included the schedule and on-time repayment of a 97 million note and accrued interest. The cash balance as of April 30, 2022 was 222 million. It was always our plan and expectation that we would raise additional funds to move beyond the initial launch of the FF91 and while the delay in our financial filings delayed certain portions of our fundraising plans, we did make progress in the areas that were open to us. Now that we are current again, we are already ramping up our fundraising activities more broadly to ensure that we have access to and consider the widest range of opportunities. We have been working actively with our financial advisors through this period, and I am pleased with where we are in that process. With that, I will hand it back to Karsten. Thank you, Betty. Again, I'm very happy to have you on our team. I would like to wrap up with four simple reasons why we are excited about Web Friday Future today. First, the changes we are making as a result of the special committee's work are already very clearly making us a stronger and better company. Second, our FF91 program is on track and proceeding well in a difficult external environment. The Hanford plant has achieved its first five milestones. Testing, validation, and equipment installation are proceeding, and we are on track to launch the FS91 in Q3 2022. Third, our agreement with Myeongqing puts our high-volume program for FS81 production on track with an attractive asset light strategy in an ideal manufacturing location to address the mass market. And most importantly, when we launch the FF91 in the third quarter, Friday Future will be the first truly high-end luxury intelligent EV manufacturer. We expect the FF91 to set a new standard for both driver and passenger experience and to redefine customer expectations for the future of mobility. Thank you for your time and interest in Friday Future, and I look forward to providing you with further updates as we move closer to launch. Thank you, Karsten. Operator, we're now ready to take questions. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Your first question comes from Dan Ides with Wedbush. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. And, uh... Congrats getting through this uh, on the other side and, and important. So can you walk us through your pricing strategy? 
in terms of you know where where we are today and and maybe going forward. Yeah, hi Dan, this is Carsten speaking. Um, let me maybe start in reflecting a little bit our marketing strategy. How how are we getting um, uh, our customers? Uh, as you know, we are in the ultra luxury segment here. Yeah, this is not about big marketing campaigns. This is more about word of mouth, strategic placements of the product, um, having key opinion leaders and influencers. So getting the word out of the brand that this is something different, something new, something great. Next step is that people have our uh, flagship store here in um, the, the first one in, in Beverly Hills, like we just announced, which will open in the fourth quarter of this year. So this will be a touch point where people can really experience a brand and experience a product. And then recently we, we got our product, we got pre-production in 10 cars in front of customers and a couple of events. So all this leads to... Um, let's say what we call uh, indication of interest. So people are interested in the company. They sign up in the web page, they come directly to us, give their, their business cards. Then the next step, what we do is we convert um, part of these indications of interest into uh, pre-orders. And pre-orders needs down payment, like I just said, $5,000, $1,500. And then the last step in the sales funnel is to really get, get, get the orders in. And if you reflect what we have right now, we disclose this 401 um, paid pre-orders. Um, this is basically the, the, the production which is intent for this year. So um, it's not about the absolute numbers. It's more about how much of what we are going to produce um, where we see pre-orders and interest already. When it comes to the detailed pricing strategy, so we are not uh, disclosing this right now. Uh, as you know, the price points are always announced uh, just a couple of weeks before you launch a product into the market because it takes a lot of, uh, let's say, competitive information of other competitors into account. Great. And could you just talk about FF91 volume expectations? Yes. So as we just said, in 2023, so full year's production 2023, we expect something between six and 8,000 units. And uh, to ramp up in 2022, uh, it's a couple of hundred units we are going to build during our ramp up. Thank you. Your next question comes from Trevor Young with Credit Suisse. Please proceed with your question. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, I was going to first ask uh, about liquidity. Um, you know, you're at 276 million of cash at the end of one uh, Q, and you noted talking about you know needing additional financing. Um, wanted to see uh, how your line of sight was looking towards securing additional funding. And then what sort of feedback you've gotten from potential counterparties uh, now that you've made your, your filings? You mentioned that was progressing. Hi, and thank you for the question. Um, we believe we have sufficient cash to reach our SOP, but raising additional funds to fully ramp up has always been part of our plans. And now that we have our filings up to date, uh, we're moving faster again on fundraising, um, realizing that it never stops, but parts clearly slowed down dramatically. Um, our cash needs change over time and with the speed of our production ramp. Uh, we have funding in place to cover our current ramp plans, but as we move further with the FF81 and beyond, our funding needs will rise substantially, and this was always the expectation. Okay, great. But thank you for that. Um, and then the next question, I guess, kind of relates to the FF81 as well. But I noticed uh, you put out a release around the end of April about adding a brake supplier for the FF91. Uh, also, just wanted to see in general where the supply chain stood in terms of readiness for the FF91, and then also how some of these supplier relationships might carry over to the FF81 and beyond. 
Yeah, as you said, supply chain, of course, is the most important thing uh, we have to take care of to build the cars. Uh, the low volume production we have is not so much a challenge from a production standpoint or from logistics, but of course we need the right parts and the right uh, quality at the right time. Now, um, as you know, supply chain in general is pretty much under pressure over the last yeah, months or year or so. Uh, material, uh, raw material prices are going up, um, so um, logistics cost is, 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 is going up. And you may hear this from many EV companies that there are definitely challenges. Uh, but the good thing is, in our case, recall that our volume is, 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 is quite small. So we are talking about a couple of hundred, uh, a couple of hundred cars this year and a couple of thousand cars uh, next year. So uh, from a, just from a volume perspective, it's not so much of a challenge to get all these, all these parts. Uh, but of course, we are concentrating extremely on building our relationship with those suppliers and maintain them. Uh, recall, um, relationship with suppliers is not a, so much a transaction. It, it's always really a relationship. You have to communicate with them on a day-to-day -day base. We have a very good team here, experienced people, uh, former colleagues I, I brought from, from BMW, which uh, have great networks worldwide, and I feel quite comfortable that we, get all, we will get all the parts and the right quality we need. Great. Thank, thank you for that. Your next question comes from Emanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed with your question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just to start with um, another question on uh, cash and liquidity, um, if I may, I, uh, are you able to dimension how much um, you're looking to raise or how much you feel that you need to sort of like um, accomplish the, uh, the full ramp up and uh, what sort of options you're looking into? As planned, um, our, our spending ramps up quickly as we move towards launch, and the, with the completion of construction and paying for it and receiving parts. Um, as we've already noted, we, we've always expected that we will need to raise additional cash to build on production and launch the FF81, the 71, and our smart last mile delivery vehicle. This has always been part of our business plan. Um, but we don't need all the capital at the same time, so that allows us to look at a range of capital raise options, different amounts and at different times. Um, given the market conditions, we, we've got to be flexible and we've got to be opportunistic. So now we're looking at a full range of options, non-dilutive to dilutive, everything from asset-based financing to converts to equity. Um, we, we have to look at the cost against the risks in every category and then make the best decision for our shareholders. Okay, so sorry, just asking this a little bit differently. The, uh, how do you expect the pace of cash burn to uh, evolve from uh, what was reported right now for the first quarter? Because uh, uh, obviously the, the queue just hit, so I'm still, still going through it, but uh, it looks like maybe free cash flow use of, uh, I don't know, 170 million dollars or so, which would be sort of like a quarter and a half of uh, you know, cash that you have currently. So are, is, is the burn improving from here or, or is it actually going uh, deeper as you get closer to uh, start of production? So as I think I, I described, we believe we have sufficient cash to reach SOP but then raising additional funds to fully ramp up to production and go into the FF81 uh, was always part of our plans, and we are accelerating our pace on fundraising. Uh, it, was, it was slowed down by the fact that our filings were not current, and we've now corrected that. Okay. And then um, I guess um, you, can you maybe – Talk about uh, your choice of uh, of partner for the FF81. Um, you know, how did you settle on this partner? Um, why this specific geography uh, location for manufacturing? I guess what are the advantages that this brings? Yeah, let me summarize first, maybe to better understand this, the uh, our manufacturing strategy. 
So we call this um, a hybrid strategy because um, there, there, there are two conflicting targets as a car maker. One is you definitely want to understand and own your manufacturing process. Yeah? This is very important to be able to deliver quality to manufacture to cost and then all these things. So you have to understand your process. On the other hand, we don't want to invest billions of dollars into, into production sites right now. Yeah? We, we need this capital to invest it into technology and products. And this is why we, why we, why we um, uh, lease our Hanford plant here in, in California, operated by our own, and we learn about the process here. We own the process. We, we ramp up the 9-1. And we were looking for a contract manufacturing partner to, to, to do the scale production for the FF81 because this would be very capital intensive. So we, we uh, talked, of course, to a couple of potential contract manufacturers, and the one we found in South Korea, Myon Chin, uh, this deal has uh, the, the bigger, two big advantages. And number one is um, our partner will do the investments. So we, there's no pre-investment needed um, uh, from, from our side. So it, it is very, very asset light from our perspective. And South Korea is a great place to export from. Yeah, so the South Koreans, they are quite good friends with most of the economies in the world. And you don't see tariffs with many countries at all. And, 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 and tariffs with other countries are very low compared to other parts in the world. So it's a great place to export from and a partner who is bearing all the upfront investments. Understood. Thank you. Your next question comes from Michael Ward with Benchmark. Please proceed with your question. Thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, what we can track as far as these milestones with your production. So you just reached milestone four, and what would be the next step? Would it be will, will there be some sort of validation that you're okay to produce? And then, um, you know, what's going to get us to start a production? How many more levels do we have till we see that? So it's basically we 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 just um, we announced six different milestones we we have to achieve, and um, we just announced the achievement of milestone number five, which is basically start um, to the implementation of uh, the machinery machinery and electric power. And um, so, so as a supply for, for the different production units. And the, the way this works in the plant, I don't know if you saw this before. So you prepare the plant from, from you, you, have, you put all the foundations in, you have to put energy supply into it, yeah, and all the logistics around it which can, can be challenging. And your equipment is pre-configured at your supplier. Uh, for example, our body shop comes from M Mino in, in, in China, so it was completely installed and tested, and it is delivered, and then you put, just put it in place and, and connect it to energy and can start with, with your trials. And so this, this milestone that we started to um, put the equipment in place uh, and the electric supply, this is the one we just reached. Uh, and the next one would then be start uh, of our pre-series production. Okay. And did I, did, it sounds did I maybe anything? all a little bit theoretical. Um, uh, I invite you and everybody to come to Hanford at any time and, and see the real progress. It's, 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 a, it's a real car plant now, and it's way easier to see it than to talk about it. And is 9-1 is kind of job one? Is that what you're thinking of? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hanford is a low-volume plant. Yeah, it's uh, the right. it's uh, invested to two GPH maximum capacity, two thousand uh, uh, ten thousand units a year. Ten thousand a year, right? Okay. And that's is that uh, is that one shift or is that two shifts? Is that what that is? Or I don't know how it, at that a plant that size. How do you gauge it? It's now right pl uh, planned for one shift operations, but of course we can scale this further. Right. Okay, now can you talk a little bit about um, the, the people you've put in place to manage this process, uh, to, to manage the ramp, start of production, and then eventually the acceleration of production in Hanford? Yeah, it's like you do it in, in a car production environment. So we have um, very experienced um, VP, Metal, who's, who's leading the plant. Um, so you, um, let's say, start with a relatively low volume, very, relatively low speed to make sure that the pro process is in place. You have quality controls on every single vehicle at the beginning. 
uh, you do the necessary rework if, if necessary to produce the, the, the quality. And with every single quality issue you learn, you implement it into your process and it gets better step by step. This is the reason why the ramp up is relatively slow, yeah? why I'm only talking about a couple of hundred right. cars a right. year. And once uh, your, your process is stable, then you can scale it and, and ramp up. And, and who, no, what, what, what management is doing that process in the background? Is, is, is Matthias Hoffman is yeah, we have a um, Matthias Hoffman who is responsible for the supply chain quality. So you, okay. you, you need two levels of quality if you want to build quality cars. One is the supply chain that you get the right parts and right quality, and the other one is the quality of the build. So Matthias is responsible that for, for, the, for the supply chain quality, and Matt Tall, who's running the plant, is responsible for the quality of the build. And then there's a quality organization in place here which um, controls and measures the quality against our trades. Okay, and what is Matal's background? He's a manufacturing guy as well. He was with Rivian before and um, with uh, GM's, I think, AMG plant. <clears throat> so, okay, extensive background. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the question and answer session, and this concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you all for your participation.